All right, warm welcome everyone to this November midday session on how to 10x your marketing productivity with the help of AI. And we're super excited to have you here, so warmly welcome. Today with us, we have two experts on AI-driven and automated content. We have Anna Porvari, who is the CEO and partner at Kubi, and we have Johanna Andrian, who is head of growth at Avao. So warmly welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. So before we start talking about the substance, we're going to just make sure you know who's talking to you. So my name is Emma Storbacka. I'm the group CEO of Avaus, uh, and we are a boutique consultancy focused on creating business value with the help of data, automation and AI, specifically in marketing, sales and service. And we're super glad to have also Anna here from Kubi. Anna, why don't you say a few words about the work you do at Kubi? Great. So Kubi is a 21-year-old uh, um, creative agency that is very focused on uh, utilizing technology, latest technology innovations, and combining creativity and technology. So we work across a number of different clients in B2B and B2C markets as well, mostly here in Finland, but also in different markets. And we really enjoy working with Kubi because we see the world of technology and marketing coming together in a very similar way. So great to have you here. Great. Thank you for inviting. So today we're going to um, give a little bit of an intro. Uh, we are going to give you three plus one CMO recommendations for how to capture the productivity potential out there now, especially with the latest generative AI boom. And then we're going to walk you through six productivity pockets and how to actually address them. And that's going to be what Anna and Johanna is taking you through after I give you the first recommendation piece. And all of the recordings and materials will be sent out. So you don't need to sit there and make notes or screenshots. Um, you will get an email with all of that shortly. You're very welcome to ask questions during the webinar. Uh, use the chat window. We will not have a live Q&A session, but we will compile all of the questions together with all of the answers and use that also in our follow-up communication. So please don't be shy and just uh, throw away whatever you have on your mind. And I love seeing those thumbs going up as well. So if you have any other opinions or you feel excited about something, don't hesitate to share your views. Oh, that's a lot of thumbs. Thank you. <laughs> Great stuff. Now, we're going to also try to do a more interactive webinar this time. So we have three polls coming up. So you're going to need to be a little bit sharp and a little bit ready. And the first poll is happening right now. And you should get a poll up on your screen, at least I do. So how automated would you say that your marketing team is right now on a scale of one to five in the core content marketing process? So all the way from planning and concepting to production and distribution of content. One being we haven't automated anything to five being we're super automated throughout the whole process. I'm going to go with a two for us. So submit your vote. And you will be able to see the results if you click polls. So as expected, perhaps most of us are in the two and three domains. We've implemented some automation already, or we're trying to automate a few things. Um, some of you, 14%, have not automated anything yet. And 0% say that we are very automated throughout the whole process, which is good to hear because if you were, I think you wouldn't be here today. So hopefully we'll be able to give some good ideas and some good inspiration on how to take a few steps on that process. So I will now start by giving you a few overarching recommendations. Um, and these are sort of targeted to a CMO persona sitting with the marketing budget, with the OPEX budgets of personnel, media spend and agency spend, trying to figure out how do we now capture this 10x productivity potential that we all feel is out there 
with the advancement of AI, data-driven ways of working, great technologies and tools. But it's not such an easy feat. And actually Gartner's uh, CMO spend survey from this year said that 75% of marketing organizations actually face pressure to do more with less because we are in a recession in many markets and we need to be able to still drive growth, but we can't expand our marketing budgets. And 86% perceive that they need to do significant changes to how they operate to make sure that you can actually reach that productivity boost. So I think the question that most of us are thinking about is how do we now leverage all of this potential that we know is out there uh, to drive a more efficient and productive marketing process? And the first recommendation that we want to give to you is um, that you need to get much more structured. Uh, to be more automated, you have to first standardize and to be able to standardize your way of working, you have to consolidate your way of working. And in most marketing teams, you are not anywhere close to this at this moment. There's too much ad hoc. There's disparate approaches for similar tasks, perhaps between different agencies or uh, content specialists or channel specialists. And, and often there is no sort of consolidated view of this is how we run our process. So, and, and if you're in a B2B uh, setting, what we often see also is that you are quite local. But in order to automate more of your content, you're going to have to be welcoming a more centralized and consolidated approach to marketing overall. So going from local to more sort of group marketing thinking and then going from channel specific to more omnichannel thinking. Those are two main drivers that will help you in this sort of path towards higher levels of automation. Now, when you have consolidated and, and you are able to form one view, then you need to standardize and codify the way that you do marketing. And this goes for anything from how you do communications and design to how you do visual frameworks uh, and, and sort of visual assets. And then also how you vary those. So for example, having a personalization framework that defines for you in a standardized way in which ways you, you personalize your content will need to be in place for you to then automate that process. So once you have consolidated and standardized, you're gonna be having an easier time automating, um, but everything can't be automated. And in those cases, you should probably try to standardize as much as possible to drive productivity. And, and AI, of course, will then aid you in this automation as we will see later during today's presentation. Now, also many of us fear that AI will do work that is not of high enough quality. And of course, at this point in time, the models that we're using, the tools that we are using, they will never be worse than they are today. So they will always, the models that we're using today are the worst AI content models that we will ever use. They will only get better from here. And I'm sure many of you agree that a lot of the stuff that you can do with AI today is already pretty amazing. But don't sort of think that this naturally means that AI will do everything. We will have uh, an important role for the sort of human in the loop process as well, setting the standards for what good looks like and what good quality deliveries look like. So structure is the first thing. And we as marketers are maybe not naturally inclined to love structure. And uh, that is something we need to work with. Now, another recommendation is to really engage also your partners around you in this productivity leap that you are addressing. So in many cases, the retainer model or the way of working that you have together with your agency is not necessarily driving a productivity agenda. And as we can see here in the quote from, from one Nordic CMO, uh, the estimate of how much of the work done by humans today that will be automated and done by machines tomorrow is rather big. And it's quite clear that unless you get your agency with you on this productivity leap, you're going to have a hard time keeping that agency or perhaps you're going to be forced to sort of have a pretty hard, harsh discussion with, with them. And you can inspire that change in your agency model 
by uh, introducing more productivity-based metrics for how you contract and how you um, measure success and, and uh, um, sort of how happy you are as a client. But you are the one giving the budget. You are the one um, owning the work. So you need to set the agenda. That's not the agency's role. Now, while you start doing this, the smart agencies are going to have good assets and good AI models uh, and good um, data to train those models on. And you want to, as a brand and as, a, as an advertiser, make sure that you're not giving away any of that AI-driven productivity potential only to your agency. So you still, just as with all of the other data, you need to own it. You need to own the tools and the licenses. You need to own the historical data. You need to own the taxonomies and so on, so that you are also free to still continue driving that productivity, um, that productivity with or without your agency partner. So that was recommendation number two. Now we come to my favorite topic, which I there's a whole YouTube presentation only about stopping to dabble or stop the dut or stop stop the piperus, as we say in Finland. Um, and this beautiful picture here is made by by AI and by one of my colleagues. You can see that the fingers are not perfect, but the, the point here is clear. So uh, we're going to need to be very systematic uh, when it comes to this productivity leap. If you have a feeling that there is a shortcut, then that's a very good telltale sign that you are uh, sort of going the wrong direction. This is not going to be one tool solving things for you. It's not going to be one new platform or one new AI model or one new AI tool. When was the last time any tool solved the problems you have in your organization, in your skill sets in your organization, in your processes? Those are leadership questions and you're going to need to lead this change in a very systematic way. And this will again demand quite new types of skill sets. And, and if I were you, I would look to sort of the, the more production oriented industries, factory line work, like what types of skill sets and roles do we have there? We have engineers, we have operations guys, we have quality assurance, we have this like number orientation, which is not the typical type of skill set you have very present in a marketing organization. So we're going to need to embrace a completely new type of personality, perhaps even in your marketing organization. And unfortunately, you won't win any Khan Lions uh, with productivity, but you will be able to drive your career as a business oriented CMO. And that is what you should sort of have top, top of mind here. So this is probably not something that's going to be something you can ask your agency to handle. You're going to need to own this agenda and work very systematically with it. And probably you're going to need to have a couple of years of plans ahead. How much productivity will we achieve? What are the milestones? What's our baseline today? And how much more could we go? And also to be able to measure and follow up and celebrate when you reach those productivity milestones. That, by the way, also will be great for your CV. Um, will require very systematic work and follow up. So those were the three recommendations. Now there is one bonus recommendation and that's for those of you who have a big in-house team or an in-house strategy. As AI makes it possible to automate away more of the work that we do, um, we have a problem when we have large in-house teams because typically they are not necessarily incentivized to automate away their own work. And they might also, due to normal life happening, be very focused on short-term problem solving. So the long-term problem solving might be how to make sure that we don't even require so many people. But that's not a problem that those people are going to be very keen on working uh, against. So that's one thing to really think about. How do we organize in a way that we can drive productivity even though we have this sort of inbuilt conflict of interest within the team. And, and I think one mistake we see quite often is that you are adding headcount into the work that you should be automating away. 
And that's sort of problematic in, in two ways. So first of all, if you hire people sh who should be automating your marketing or making your marketing more productive, they should not be required two years from now. So it's not a very good sort of recruitment to make. Um, and then the other thing is that you need very different skill sets for, for building and maintaining sort of a productive marketing machine. So even though you hire today into your in-house team, it might be that those skill sets are obsolete once sort of the job is done. Maybe there's something else that they can jump jump onto, but still to, sort of, to have this with you and think very carefully is, is a good idea. And one, one thing that we see in the market now uh, very much is going from this sort of pure in-house to a more strategically crafted outsourced in-house uh, team or a hybrid setup where you have some team members who are clearly tasked to drive productivity and also clearly incentivized to do so. So not only consultants that you take in on a retainer on an hourly basis, but who actually have some sort of incentive model through the collaboration that you have to drive a significant jump in productivity. So the three plus one bonus tip is to, to reconsider the way that you are organized for the long-term benefit. So those were the recommendations from sort of a CMO and leadership standpoint. And now we're gonna go into the productivity pockets and how to address them. And I will give over to Johan and I will be doing the clicking, Johanna. So you have to point at me if I'm not clicking in the right. Amazing. Uh, I always wanted a human, a human clicker in my life. Good. So let's dig a bit deeper into what are, are these productivity pockets we're talking about and why are we so confident that they are there? Well, because we've seen them, we tried them, we tested them and we confirmed them. So what we see in forward-leaning and successful marketing organizations today is in specific areas, there is really, really big pockets of productivity that could be achieved. We see it in in telco, we've tried out looking at increasing the productivity in terms of the early stages of this um, supply chain. So looking at the briefing and planning platform. So consolidating that, increasing productivity by 3x. In the content production side, being able to increase the, the efficiency in the way we find, um, locate, fetch, and identify content we've seen a productivity uplift of 5x. And then there's the craft part, actually kind of increasing the output of your content. And Anna will talk more about this, but this is a really big productivity pocket, especially as your demand for more assets is already there or you're heading into that wall as you move into a more personalized experience. And then we have the publishing side, so actually activating these assets and being smarter in the way that you manage your channels and specifically your media spend. So being able to utilize that data that you should own, activating that out in your channels, being smarter and reducing your waste in your media budgets. Now, this is a full end to end process, and there are a lot of different areas where you can find productivity and they are interconnected. And even though you can start in some of the areas, you need to be systematic in the way you approach it. But it also looks quite different depending on your organization. So depending on the complexity of the way you are set up, depending on the maturity, the skill sets that you have, and also the ambition level. Now, what we would suggest you to reflect upon while me and Anna walk you through some more concrete examples is what are these productivity pockets for, for you and where are the biggest ones? So if we look at a light framework, I get my human clicker, good. Um, I mean, there are these type of productivity enhancements, they do come with an investment the size of that investment and the uplift on the other side, as said, depends on where you are on your journey. 
Now, this is an illustrative example. Um, I talked to, to Emma earlier this morning, morning and said, well, that number E, orchestration, that's probably a big investment and a big productivity improvement for a lot of organizations out there. But there are also a lot of organizations out there where this is not a too complex question or you already made really big leaps. So understanding where these pockets are and where you should focus your time is probably the first exercise that you want to do. Now I'm going to hand over to Anna and now we're going to do a poll. Yes. Before we go into the details of all of those six productivity pockets, let's have a little bit of feeling for how much and what types of AI tools are you using today for your uh, marketing function. I'm going to go ahead and click all three because I've used them all even this week. So we see here that text generation, 72%, photo generation, 23, 24, and video and sound, 7%. 69, 24, 7. Perfect. Perfect. Very interesting fact. So let's look at what that might look at when you look like when you scale up in your marketing process. So Anna, go ahead. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, it'll definitely be interesting to see what the numbers look like in in three months or six months or 12 months from now. So let's keep a tab on that. But makes makes sense that the text chat GPT is probably the most commonly used. But yes, let's dive into the um, exact uh, examples of the different productivity pockets that we have identified uh, together. And we'll start with the planning, briefing, and collaboration. Um, and, and as discussed already earlier, the, the different pain points depend, of course, on the, on the company and the organization, the market, the, the industry, and everything. But some of the common commonalities that we have experienced working with, with, uh, with our clients is um, that the collaboration tools or the briefing tools can be very fragmented. Um, and when we're utilizing different tools and solutions for, for briefing, for example, something might be via email, something is on Slack, something is on WhatsApp, something is over a phone call. It is very fragmented. And of course, there's different parties involved. So having that same information travel to all of the different agencies, all of the different parties involved um, can, can be very difficult for the marketeer and very time consuming. And then also kind of making sure that everyone understands the goals and objectives and, and understands their roles and responsibilities. And at the same time, who is actually the decision maker, who is, who is making the final decisions, who, who we need to get the buyout from. So what we are seeing is uh, the biggest um, time saver is standardizing and automating also the briefing and feedback process and the workflows. So having the data-driven insights, oh, too fast, <laughs> human clicker. Um, so having the data-driven insights and planning, having having the data will, Johanna will be talking about more of the reporting and automated reporting in the back in, uh, towards the end. But of course that kind of drives already to the front and the beginning of the process. So it really is a loop more than more than anything else. Um, but having having AI also help generate the briefs, notifications, and especially creating the culture of testing and piloting. So freeing up time from, for example, just briefing different different parts and different pockets, having that testing and piloting culture in place again amongst all of the different parties involved is super important, and that gives us the opportunity to follow the. The logic of uh, eighty percent is the kind of the normal normal work, and twenty percent can be spent on innovation and, and testing and piloting. So that way, we can actually find what works and how we get more productivity. So just by standardizing, having the faster turnaround from briefs to actual uh, launch of the campaign or launch of the of the pro, pro, um, project, and then 
of course, we would all love spending less time in meetings and uh, more time in actually doing the productive work. So now, please, thank you. Uh, so a little bit more, more concrete or kind of uh, summarizing, uh, consolidating everything into one single platform that is being used. And it doesn't matter as much which platform is being used, but it matters that everything is consolidated. Of course, there's different platforms that work better for different different functions, but the, the idea and having that, that thought in head that, okay, we need to consolidate, we need to be smarter in terms of how we actually start the project, how we, how we uh, brief uh, agencies. And, and that applies to all of the work that is being used. And then having that also a standardized process, one process that um, is, is carried through all of the different uh, parts of the, of the project, of the briefing, of the planning, and also having the um, ownership iterations, uh, everything kind of defined and standardized as much as possible. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time we start a project, for example. Or we have different different team members or different agencies joining joining the the work. Uh, we've also seen that having AI generated briefs um, can can be a huge help in terms of what we are doing. Um, having a little bit more uh, sharper target audiences or or any information that we are sharing, and and then spending the human time in actually reviewing. So it's easier to actually review and, and comment on something rather than uh, spending the time in trying to uh, word things in the right way. And again, looping back to the previous campaigns and insights from the campaigns that have been done. So the next pocket is then the concepting phase. And this can be very time consuming. So once we have received the brief, uh, typical, typical world agencies go back and maybe spend a couple of weeks thinking about what was, what was in the brief, how should we go about, how, we, how do we find insights and how do we find uh, information about the previous campaigns, what, what worked, what didn't work, what kind of ideas can we generate and get from, from global campaigns. Um, so the, the idea generation is, is extremely slow and happens oftentimes also in silos. So different agencies don't necessarily uh, collaborate in terms of finding the best ideas and how the different uh, agency strengths can be utilized for the marketeers benefit in terms of getting the best ideas and guess best concepts out there that also then work regardless of the different media channels. So as we know, uh, the touch points are being very fragmented and, and we're seeing and meeting the consumers in all of the different outlets. And we need to be um, very consistent in terms of how we, how we um, approach and how we meet the, the consumers. So we've been testing a lot of the different AI solutions um, for, for, with our clients and for our clients and, and internally as well, and, and kind of trying to find how do we use AI to, to help us with the, uh, all the, already the data crunching, but then also kind of using ChatGPT or any other AI tools as our sparring partners. So we, we try to have the AI boost our brainstorming sessions and, and also craft the first drafts of visuals or, or mood boards, things like that, so that we can have something concrete to show when we go and meet with a client. And that speeds up the process a lot. And of course, then we can free up the human power to, to do the work where it makes the most sense and that's what's the most value added. And kind of what Emma said already earlier, we don't win uh, con, con cases with the, uh, being productive, but if we can increase our productivity and free up time from the, from the mundane tasks, we can of course have the uh, free time, utilize the free time in coming up with the great ideas and then hopefully go and win in con as well. So, so really, when it comes to the concepts, uh, consolidating all the data that we have using benchmarks and uh, previous campaigns as the starting point. Uh, one great example, for example, is that 
there's a lot of data out there and you can easily find the most easily recognizable um, insights from the data. But utilizing AI to kind of ask what are the what are some of the insights that are not so typical? What can what other information can you point out from the from the data that you don't necessarily think of think of to look in the first place? Um, and then kind of again standardizing the process, uh, teaching AI your your specific tone of voice, your brand uh, look and feel, your um, your tonality, and different. Um, assets or aspects of your brand that you want to make sure that are always communicated and that way have the um, kind of the brand specific requirement prompts already ready and use them test them and of course always define as you go so not every time needs to be reinvented again and and that's how we get then hundreds of different ideas uh, some will be great some will not be as great but at least it gives a starting point something to make make uh, the decisions on or having something to react to um, and guide us to to go further in the uh, and go forward in the in the concepting phase So once we are clear on the on the concept, uh, moving on to the the content and the content creation, and I think what we are all hearing a lot with the uh, AI and how AI is changing changing what consumers are expecting from us is uh, a lot more personalization. So personalized messaging is going to be driving a lot of the work that we are doing. And it's not enough to go with one or two messages to everyone, but having very specific uh, way to address uh, consumers, regardless where you meet them, whether it's newsletters or, or website or it's banner advertising or anything. So basically anywhere where the consumers can interact with the brand. But this, this requires a lot of manual work still, and, and we come up with limited variations. Uh, that are not personalized and, and repurposing can also be very difficult. Um, and because a lot of the work is manual, so it's time consuming and there, therefore oftentimes the quality can be compromised and we don't have the time to do the wow elements, something that really resonates with the consumers, something that leaves the uh, memory memory and can be memorable and leaves kind of like the lasting impression that stays with you. So we want to make sure that we're starting to utilize a lot of the different AI powered uh, creative optimization tools also in the content production so that then when we have most of the work, kind of the baseline of the work is done um, automated and, and utilizing different technologies that are available, we can free up the time from the humans, from our uh, genius graphic designers to actually do the wow that is required to have the, the impact that everyone wants to be making. And with the masses of information flowing around and, and um, reaching all of the different uh, consumers, it's also important that we make sure that the brand assets stay very standardized and stay the same so that everyone who is seeing even a little piece of the of the advertising or different assets can re it resonates quickly who is this this brand for and i think coca-cola or mcdonald's are great examples of of having very identifiable and recognizable brand assets they've done a lot of work on that and regardless of you see it's just a very scattered little piece of it and you can you can already know who it's for so therefore having a lot of time spent on on um, ensuring that the assets stay the same and and also the taxonomy tagging is done in a in a standardized way uh, frees up a lot of time in terms of finding where the assets are being being held and and of course having them in one single single location where everyone can access so we try to eliminate a lot of the manual versions and controls downloads uploads uh, automate of, of, of that as much as possible 
So really the, the key, what we are seeing is uh, having the content in one single place, uh, not in different computers and different uh, uh, files and, and sharing the different files, but really having one uh, digital asset management system that everyone can access regardless of, of which team or which agency or which uh, department from, from the organization people are coming from. And that that helps finding the finding the assets and then also having the dynamic design, having the framework for the uh, for design and having the master assets, having those recognizable pieces of information that can then be utilized for for templates and specifying the the assets, what is required for the assets. So having the different elements that then combine the assets. And as much as we we can, we we should be utilizing different uh, tools and automation, uh, automate automated tools to help um, create those different content variations and assemble the different elements of the uh, advertising into into the assets that are required. Um, and with this, we can quickly and easily create a number of different. Um, a mm, number of different uh, uh, creatives to make sure that we can also address the personalization needs and the needs of different target audiences and different markets, different languages, different uh, kind of people that we want to address and, and communicate with. Good. Then I'll take over from here and we'll look how we get this content out. So we looked at the earlier stages of the marketing or content process. Now, if we look at how do we get this content out into our different channels or customer interactions, Anna mentioned it as well. And I believe many of you listening in can recognize a setup where you are downloading assets from one place uploading them to another place or even asking a colleague to resend an email dubbing, double checking that email and then realizing there was an additional round of iterations and go back so i mean that's that's the typical process that we see it is it's very very common out there to have a manual setup for the way that you get your content out into to publishing and into your activation channels this, this means that there's a lot of different types of, of pain points, both in time, but also in terms of testing and viewing and being able to, to edit on the go within those channels um, and kind of be able also to reuse and see the scalability of what you do. There are a couple of different solutions to, to this. The repository question is, is one. There's a lot about making sure that your assets are tagged. So actually making your content pieces more into data products. So you're able to identify them. You're able to identify which of your content assets would match together, which are the correct format and in which channel should they be available. And once you have that in place, you're able to, to automate the publishing process. And there's a lot of efficiencies to be gained in that just based on, on the manpower typically involved in these type of setups. If we look at what that could, could look like, I think one of the things to, to remember is when you look at the distribution and publishing of content, there's typically a longer supply chain involved than you might think. We tend to talk about digital asset management platforms that should be your single single source of truth and they should it's a great type of of technology for consolidating maybe primarily your your images your videos your animations but there's a lot of other repositories of content that you have in your organization that could be a pim system hosting all of your product information or prices that you want to be able to to push into communication that's going out it could be contracts or FAQs, or there's a lot of other systems and platforms where you have content um, that's also part of that supply chain. 
So from a consolidation point of view, where you want to start is understanding how that supply chain looks, try to limit the repositories that you have. There is usually duplicates, so several repositories used for, for the similar purpose, but in different parts of the organization, and try to simplify that process of how you consolidate content from your different repositories. For this then to, to work, and in the next stage, now this is my, my if Emma's favorite topic is stop the dabbling, taxonomy and metadata is my favorite topic within this area. So in order for this to, to work, you need to have a rather clear content structure and taxonomy. And that means identifying the way that you are able to categorize your content. And this is not only kind of naming conventions and being able to fill them in the correct folder structure. This is actually tagging that content with metadata across your different repositories. And that metadata could be, have, I mean, it could have different purposes. It could look different um, and it could be in different formats, but there's two main categories here that you want to make sure that you cover. The first one is descriptive metadata. So how do you describe your content? So this is, it could be, is there a product in this image? Which product ID is, um, would represent that product. Now, that product ID is a key across probably several of your repositories, making it possible for you to standardize the process of how you work with product related content, for example. But it could also be soft things such as this is related to the winter season or summer, or there's a human being here, which is in an urban setting. Like there's a lot of different types of descriptive metadata that you can have. And it depends on kind of what type of organization you have, what type of content and communication strategies you have in place. But this brings together the possibility to identify content in, in a multiple different ways and be able to relate content. So you have a better picture of what you actually have. And then we have the functional metadata. So functional metadata is more kind of technical metadata. So what format is this? How heavy is this asset? Uh, what channels would it be appropriate for? And also one of the most important and hideous tasks of making sure that you have tagged all of your content with the correct license and rights to use it. So are you to be able to kind of standardize and in the next step be able to automate, you need to have those type of safeguards in order to make sure that you don't accidentally send out a lot of content you're not allowed to use in a specific way. Once you have that in place, you have a solid foundation to start automating. You will have common identifiers across your, your assets and probably ac across your repositories. So this means you're able to push content all the way throughout to your specific channel. And you're also able to gather insights on a more granular level. You can categorize what type of content um, has what type of impact, how is that being received by the market? And with the more metadata you have on your assets, the more analysis you can make on, on the reasoning to that. Now, this is just being able to push content from out in, in, in one channel. I mean, we live in, in a world of, of a multi-channel experience and this is an area where there is likely a lot of productivity to be gained. Usually what we see is a rather siloed organization in terms of the way that you orchestrate your communication, siloed either on channel or campaign or specific segments or however it might be. This leads to an, too little structure and, and frameworks in the way that you reach out and are able to orchestrate your channels. Over communicating to some customers, under communicating to others, mixed messaging. And it leads to waste. It leads to waste in, in our time. It leads to waste in, in, our, in our media budgets. 
Uh, so there's a lot of things we can do in this area. And this is the solutions around these are typically kind of centralizing your decisioning, thinking about this from an omnichannel perspective and making sure that you have kind of the same basis on where how you feed both data and, and content out to your channels. Now, where you start is to get your spaghetti straight. Now, in a modern marketing organization, there are a lot of different stakeholders. We're well aware there are agencies for each and every part of what you do. There are in-house teams in different areas. There are business stakeholders all over the place. And there's a couple of random consultants sitting in a room somewhere. Um, so, I mean, getting this spider web of the way that you work today, um, both internally, but also with your partners is the first step. So what communication is actually going out? For which purposes is, is it going out? So getting together, getting that cross channel planning in place, getting a priority framework in place and making sure that you try to set a cross marketing strategy. And, and this is not necessarily simple. This someone, someone will, someone will lose, someone will win, not necessarily, but that tends to be the feeling. So by getting together and getting a holistic view of what you're doing and what you're communicating is a key. And I, there's probably some of you who think you have the big picture, but there is very few of out there who actually has the possibility to have a holistic picture today. Once you have that in place, you want to start um, getting some of the hygiene rules in place, uh, get a traffic control system of, of how that communication goes out, start activating your, your data to get there. But in the end, to fully automate this, you want to end up in a more centralized decisioning, which is likely AI or machine learning driven. We usually talk about models such as next best offer or next best action to be that kind of central decisioning, which is independent of channel, um, but supports you to scale. And once you have that in place, you can start also then automating the full on publishing based on that type of decisioning. Now, um, Anna started, started out with saying that this is a loop. It is a loop. And in order to, to really find those productivity pockets, you need to understand where there is productivity to be gained and where there is increased impact to be found. And that's where kind of your reporting and measurement framework comes in. And this is maybe, I know there's a lot of people spending a lot of time on ad hoc and manual reporting. There's probably pr a lot of productivity gains to be found there, but the main productivity gain here is understanding where, where to put your money and where to put your time. And from a solution point, point of view, if we go one more slide, good. Where you likely want to start is to consolidate your findings, get the big picture in place, get an under, a clear understanding throughout your organization. What are you really optimizing towards? This is usually there is usually a lot of sub-optimization going on throughout your marketing organization, really bringing yourself together, identifying what are those core KPIs and objectives that we are, are aiming to push. This gives you a good foundation to start really measuring and reporting on the correct metrics. And it gives you as a marketing organization really the power to move from being seen as a cost center to being seen as a profit center. But to do that, you need to feel confident in the impact that you have. And one of the biggest things that we typically work with is getting a measurement framework in place. So that means having a strategic control group set up so that you can with confidence say that what we do is delivering on incremental uplift in sales or whatever it might be for your organization. Now on the AI side, 
there's a lot of really cool stuff happening when it comes to auto-generated insights, our ability to go kind of in a text to query setup or we can prompt a question and we can get it back, a new, new way to interact and discuss and explore our data. There's plenty of good tools today, but they're also in, in early stages and a lot of things are, are developing rapidly with the LLMs and the development of LLMs going forward. So I think we should start to, to look around the corner where this is likely the way we will do reporting and insight generation going forward. It won't be standardized dashboards that none of us really look at, um, but actually something that is much more actionable for us, something that's much more real time and closer to our business and, and also supports our own skills development in, in being data driven and insights driven. And that's probably more in the generated part. Good. Super stuff, Anna and Johanna, very detailed. And as you all can hear, there's a lot of expertise and a lot of practical experience. So we can't go into all of it, but this was a overview of how to address those six productivity pockets. So now for the last poll, please let us know within which of these six areas do you think your biggest productivity potential is? So maybe not your personally, but your organization's biggest productivity potential. And now let's remember also that productivity is not necessarily about sort of taking the area where we're doing the most and then doing that more efficiently. It could also be, for example, under investing in reporting because it's just too much. And if we could 10x our productivity in reporting, perhaps we would be more data and insights driven. So what do the results say? Content, clear number one, reporting, uh, also very high up and the planning briefing and collaboration process really interesting results i hope that you've got some good practical insights on how to address those from the presentation so if we do round up now here and and give you a few takeaways um, number one is that there are several different content uh, sorry uh, productivity pockets within your marketing process these are the six main ones. There are probably more, but, but through this framework, you're able to find um, sort of the ones where you should perhaps focus. And AI is bringing us the possibility, of course, to automate more of the work that we're doing. However, it requires that we consolidate, standardize in order to then automate more. This is a leadership question. So you, as a marketing leader, need to lead both your in-house and stakeholders in the, in the organization, as well as your external partners towards this productivity vision. And systematic execution, stopping the doubling, that is really key for success. So this is not something that's going to be one tool that solves it all. Uh, it's not about telling your team to use more AI. It's going to be you making a strategy for how you do this productivity leap. And quite likely, it will also require some investment up front. Uh, but often, you are also able to shift OPEX from, from headcount and media spend into driving productivity agendas. And nothing sounds better to a CFO than doing that type of prioritization shift. So if you think this sounds interesting, there are basically two, two ways that you can address uh, this potential. So one way is that you actually look at your entire sort of marketing function and, and how you can transform that to the sort of 10x target state, or maybe it's 5x for you, or maybe it's 25x for you. And, and you take more of a, a kind of transformational approach where you look at the long term and, and do a diligent plan and business case and, and milestones and, and so on. Or then you maybe address it a bit more in an agile way, and you perhaps have campaign coming up, you have a product launch coming up, you have something that you would be doing anyways, and then you decide to address one of these pockets in this initiative. And in the best of cases, you even sort of run a parallel process, which is like the boosted productivity boosted one and one which is not, and then you can compare the results, especially if you're looking at the more like orchestration part, then it's very easy to do A-B testing in this domain. 
So either transformation or then pilot, but hopefully a pilot as well, will over time lead to that you take a bigger step towards productivity. And if you're interested in getting a view of how much productivity gains you have in your current marketing team setup, feel free to reach out for a free of charge productivity business case where we follow this process, where we help you um, analyze your current productivity pockets and also where you probably should get started. Um, and to set this off, we start with an NDA, we do a survey, we do a few interviews to follow up, and then we do a presentation and, and a wrap up together with, with the CMO and the kind of closest stakeholders, whoever those might be. And if you're interested, then please email jennifer.sandstrom at avaus.com. And this free offer is only in place for um, a week from now. But if you're interested in doing this or you're watching the recording, of course, send us an email um, and we'll set it up. The last thing I want to leave you with before we end this one hour session is a warm welcome to the best AI event for sales and marketing leaders next year, which is a combination of Avaus expert talks and the sales conference by, by Mercury. It's gonna be in Stockholm for a full day at München Bryggeriet, as well as hybrid uh, access through, through an online portal. Uh, sign up now because the seats are limited. We're gonna gather around 600 leaders in marketing and sales to talk about how we go beyond the hype with AI in marketing and sales. Thank you so much for active participation and all of your emoji reactions. Here are some other events uh, that we have coming. Our next webinar is gonna be on the 29th of November. Uh, you'll surely get an invitation just for being here. So thanks a lot. Thanks Anna and thanks Johanna for sharing your insights and experiences and see you all soon. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Happy have a good to day. Yep. Have a good day. Happy to continue the conversation with everyone.